Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Uh, terima kasih untuk hadirin yang hadir. Jadi kita akan mulakan uh, sesi uh, seminar or teaching kita tentang pain as a vital sign. This is a training module for a doctors. There is another uh, separate uh, training modules for nurses or paramedics. Yeah. So. What happened uh, previously, a uh, few years back, uh, we implement the uh, pelaksanaan tahap kesakitan sebagai tanda vital signs uh, or pain as a vital sign in uh, 2008. So now, uh, currently, pain as a vital sign is a must or a, a, a mandatory requirement for the to success or to get the uh, title of a pain-free hospital. So in the policy statement on the pain-free hospital or program, pain is one of the vital signs, is a must, must be assessed in all patients, standardized pain assessment tools uh, must be applied consistently, and the healthcare provider should listen and respond promptly to patient's report of pain and manage pain appropriately. Healthcare facility staff should be continually educated and aware assessment and management. So for the criteria for the pain-free hospital, uh, number one, uh, first of uh, uh, first and foremost is actually to have a written policy on the pain assessment and management, and the second is to implement pain as the fifth vital signs. So this is why we have to learn uh, about pain as a fifth vital science. And uh, for the objective of these training modules, uh, mainly is actually not to get the title of the pain free hospital. The main things why we need to learn and to uh, apply this knowledge and uh, document it as a pain as a fifth vital science is to create a better awareness of the pain and to to have a better pain management and of course we want to train uh, the doctors nurses and all healthcare personnel in a pain assessment and approach to pain management that's that is why we need to implement the pain as a vital sign in all hospitals and also clinics and we want to work towards a pain free hospitals so hsajb has a uh, uh, been uh, uh, select as a one of the pain free hospitals since 2018 just prior to the COVID pandemic and we would like to invite our cluster hospital uh, Pontian and also Pulai to join us soon as a pain free hospitals. So prior to 2008 there is only four vital signs temperature, pulse rate respiratory rate and also but blood pressure among all these four vital signs as compared to pain is actually um, those vital signs is very objective you can measure while the pain you must is a is a very subjective and the healthcare personnel must ask the patient in order to get the score so as I said, when you ask and when you greet the patient and ask about the pain score, meaning that there is a communication between patients and doctors or patient and paramedics. While other vital signs is zero communication. A barrier to the pain management, basically there are two. One is inadequate pain assessment and the second one, lack of awareness. Awareness can happen when you didn't ask. So when you don't ask, you won't know what happened or what the, our patient is suffering. I love this slide. If you know, notice, 2001, USA started this pin as a free vital sign. It's good that we start this uh, um, adding on the uh, uh, the free vital signs. What happened after that, one year later, Australia and one year later, Europe is following what the USA is doing. Singapore, our neighbor started their pain as a free vital sign four years later, three years later. Uh, um, 
Malaysia, we started our pilot project in Hospital Selayan 2006 and about 7 years we are behind USA uh, and 4 years are behind Singapore uh, for the pain uh, to implement pain as a free vital science. For the benefits of the pain as a free vital science, there are 3 categories. So the first one is to promote doctor, patient and also nurse patient interactions. Uh, with that, we have a better communications and better patient satisfaction. Uh, to, we also are uh, able to provide a better patient care. Uh, we can priority the pain assessment and we, we even can individualize the care. The third one, we can actually have a better awareness of the pain. Then we have a better management of the pain, faster recovery and reduce length of stay. Approach to the pain, we can use this RAT model. So based on this RAT model, we can actually divide it into three. First, we recognize the pain. Second, we assess the pain. And third, T treat, we treat the pain. So how to approach the to the pain? One is recognize. So does the patient have pain? Do other pa people know patient has a pain? Approach to pain in our assessment is we need to ask about the severity part and also other factors compounding. And the treatment, of course, we want to know whether we need to treat non-drug or with the drug treatment. So at the end of this course, inshallah, you will be able to understand the importance of the treating pain and also recognize, assess and treat different types of pain. So, first of all, what is pain? This definition is taken from the IASP uh, 1996, but then we do have uh, the current um, update 2021 about these definitions. But based on the first, uh, uh, the, the initial definition, pain is unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with the actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So, questions. What does this mean? Are there any defini definitions? So, based on this uh, definition, so we as a healthcare provider must understand that pain is unpleasant. Emotions are important. The cause is not always visible. For the patient, pain is what patient says. It hurts. What are the consequences of not treating acute pain? To our surprise, there is a lot of a system in our body affected when we didn't or we ignore the pain. So what happened? In a cardiovascular system, when you have a pain, you ignore it, you didn't treat properly, there is an increase in the heart rate, increase in the sympathetic activity that leads to the myocardial oxygen demand and leads to the MI. If MI, we may lose the patients. Respiratory system, let's say there is a multiple rate fracture, there is a lots of pain, patients try to avoid breathing or there is a splinting of shallow breathing that lead to atelectasis, hypoxemia and lead to the pneumonia. Patient may require ventilation and ICU. GI system, there is an impact in the GI mortality, constipation, delays recovery, and so on with the general and musculoskeletal system, psychological, and neuroplasticity. So as I summarized just now, adverse effect of severe acute pain can be a lot, huh? can be multi-systems, multi multi cardiovascular, respiratory, neuroendocrine, musculoskeletal, GI, and acute pain may change into a chronic pain if we didn't treat properly. And we also emphasize about the psychological impact of pain. It can cause anxiety and insomnia. And of course, economical, the patient has a more stays in the hospitals, increase uh, hospital complication and increase healthcare utilization and costing. So let's go and let learn about the classifications of pain. So pain can be classified into three. So 
you can uh, classify pain based on the duration, cause and also mechanism. For the duration, we can have acute, chronic or acute on chronic. While the cause, we can be, we can divide into cancer and non-cancer. While mechanism, we can uh, divide into nociceptive and neuropathy. So acute versus chronic pain. So what does it mean? Acute pain means that there is a recent onset and probably of a limited durations. While the chronic pain is a pain persisting beyond the healing of the injury and often not identifiable cause. Chronic pain usually happen when the pain persisting persistent more than three months. So acute pain can be uh, a happy ending that the patient will turn out to be no pain when we treat it, we treat it properly or when there is the wound is healing properly. But there is a certain patients that may change into may progress into chronic pain and some patients will uh, will have a rebound between acute and chronic pain. So again, for the uh, specificity of the uh, difference between acute and chronic pain, we can categorize further into uh, onset and timing, the signal, the severity, CNS involvement, and also psychological effects. Acute pain, as we know just now, is very sudden, short duration while the chronic pain usually persistent and more than three months while the signal for the acute pain can have a warning sign warning sign of the actual or potential tissue damage while the chronic pain can be not there is a false alarm severity correlates with the amount of damage in the acute pain while the severity in a chronic pain is not correlated CNS involvement with the dysfunctional can be more in a more significant in the chronic pain, while the psychological impact can have more in the uh, chronic pain. Patient will develop anger, fear, social withdrawal. But not to say that acute pain doesn't have bad. Acute pain may have may experience a psychological effect, but the the, the symptom may be less or can be. Uh, the, the symptom can be like anxiety or sleep, sleeplessness. So what are the common causes of acute pain? Usually patients who actually have acute pain is patient trauma patient, those came in because of the fracture, post-op patient uh, require surgeries, uh, burns, arthritis, abscesses, uh, MI or labor pain and childbirth. While the chronic pain usually is a patient who presented with the chronic headache, lower back pain, chronic abdominal pain, pelvic pain, and also cancer pain. So remember just now our divisions of the pain classification. One is the bulk duration. The second one, mechanism. So mechanism can be divided into nociceptive and also neuropathic. Nociceptive is a well localized while the neuropathic is not well localized. Nociceptive is sharp, worse with the movement and there is no obvious tissue injury or illness. It, it, it has an inflammation and also physiological pain. While the neuropathic pain usually is shooting, burning, numbness, pain and needles, tissue injury may not be obvious and there is a, some kind of a nerve injury, changes in wiring, abnormal firing and also loss of modulations. Neuropathic pain always associated with the pathological pain. Neuropathic pain can be defined as a pain that is caused by lesion or disease of the somatosensory system. So it can be periphery, it can be central nervous system or it can be both. Such as a traumatic brachial plexus injury, diabetes mellitus, carpal tunnel syndrome, post-hepatic neuralgia. For the CNS can be central post-stroke pain and also neuropathy associated with the spinal cord injury. So cancer versus non-cancer, of course cancer it has a, been a progressive disease and may be a mixture of acute and chronic while the non-cancer pain can be many different acute or chronic. So, the, so why we need to know about the, uh, the pain physiology? So basically uh, many factors affect how we feel. So psychological factors are very important. So different treatment works on a different parts of the pathway. So that's why I show you this diagram. So you can see that pain physiology have a four steps from the periphery, 
it goes to the spinal cord, through the brain, modulations, and let's see step by step. So what happens when you have a tissue injury? So there is a release of chemicals, stimulations of the pain receptors, which is nociceptors, and it travels in a delta and signal fiber to the spinal cord. So what happens in the spinal cord? There is a connection, uh, there is a synapse connect with the second nerve and it travels opposite side of the spinal cord to the brain. The brain, there is a thalamus where, is a, where the second relay station is and it will connect to the cortex, limbic system and also brain stem. So pain perception occurs at the cortex. So the last step will be the modulation where there is a descending pathway from the brain to the dorsal horn and usually it decreases the pain signals. So as a summary, many factors affect how we feel pain. Different treatment works on the different parts of the pain pathway. Important to differentiate between types of pain. Neuropathic pain and nociceptive pain are different, hence are treated differently. Acute pain and chronic pain are not the same. Acute pain is a symptom. Chronic pain is a disease. Treatment for each of them is different. Chronic pain has to be managed. Multidisciplinary, multimodal approach is more viable in the long term. Let's go to the most important part, pain assessment. Remember just now you greet our patients, we, we introduce ourselves and we ask about the pain score. When the patient shared how much the pain score and the severity, this is the time for us to properly assess the pain. So basically, we need to produce a baseline to assess the therapeutic intervention. So why? Because we want to see the progress. And also, the facilitates uh, communication between staff and looking after the patient and for the documentation purposes. How to assess pain? Of course, we must open our mouth, ask the patients. After we ask the patient, patient uh, give the info about the pain, we must believe what they are saying. So how to assess pain? Basically, after you know that the patient is having pain, the patient already talk about the pain score, you must ask about the, um, elaborate about the pain uh, based on this mnemonic, P-A-I-N. P is a place or site of the pain. Where does it hurt? Record in the body chart. A, aggravating factors. What makes your pain worse? I is intensity. How bad is the pain? N is a natural and neutralizing factors. What does it feel like? And what makes the pain better? So, through the clinical techniques for the measurements of pain, we can uh, divide into two. One is a self-reporting by the patients which is a gold standard and best method. The second one is based on the observer assessment. It's basically uh, based on the behavior and also vital sign and it's all is uh, about the functional assessment. So we go to the um, pain, uh, pain uh, assessment in uh, for adult patients. We use a MOH pain scale. We have a, a a uh, uh, scale 0 to 10, 0 means no pain, 10 worst pain you can imagine. So what is your pain score now? So patient is asked to show the severity of the pain, which is recorded as a number 0 to 10, while 4 and 5 would be a middle or the average pain. Pain measurement uh, skill used in the children and infants and in cognitively impaired patients we use the IASP face pain scale or we call it as a self-report scale or the other one is a flat scale or we call it as a behavioral pain scale. So for the IASP face skills is a self-report tool. So age of 3 to 7 years old, we don't mention about the numbers. We just show about the face and then ask the, uh, 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 the patients to show which uh, what describe her, uh, uh, her, her pain based, based on the face. While the flat score is usually we use for the patient who is less than 3 years old and also for those who we unable to elicit because of the sedations 
or because the patient GCS is not full or patient who is actually demented. So flex score equals to F is face, L is legs, A is activity, C is cry, C is consolability. Each of the five categories carries mark score from 0 to 10 and total uh, range is 0 to 10. So when should be pin when should pin be assessed? Basically at every time when you took other vital signs. So if you took the other four vital signs uh, for hourly, definitely pain score you must ask together with that. Uh, when the patient admit and when the patient transfer in of patient. So at other times apart from shadow observation is basically when you want to administer uh, medications pain relief uh, before any interventions and whenever the patient complain of the pain. So who should be assessed? Definitely all patients. Any patients in labor room, OT, ICU, CCU, ambulatory daycare surgery uh, units and also in the clinics. Who does pain assessment? Basically everyone all nurses and paramedics, all doctors, all student nurses, medical student and also aligned, uh, aligned health personnel. So the selection of the PIN assessment tool, the use of the standard tool for the PIN assessment, we use the appropriate skill and appropriate for the age learning and development. Remember, always use the same tool for the same patients. So remember, I recap back. For the adult, we use the MOH scale, which have a 0 to 10. We can ask the patient to tell the numbers of the pain score. For the pediatric age group, we can divide it into 3. 1 month to 3 years old using a flex score. 3 to 7 years old IASP face scale. While more than 7 years old, we use a MOH pain scale. So, Previously, unable to assess patient like sedated, unconscious patient, we can actually put as a UTC or UT, UTS or UTA, unable to assess or unable to score. But now we have to be, there is a dynamic changes in order to make the system better. So those patients in this category, we should use a flex score. This is one of the examples of the nursing observation chart. You saw the PS after the temperature, that is a, our pain score. So let's go to the acute pain management. Overview of the pain management, basically we want to discuss about non-drug and also drug treatment where you work. And also we want to classify pain treatments. So for the non-drug treatment, we do have actually, we can categorize into physical and also psychological. Physical can be rest ice, compressions and elevations or we call it as a dries. We can do the surgery to reduce the pain, physiotherapy, acupuncture and also massage. While the psychological, we explain and reassurance and also counseling. Psychological method can be support, support explanation, relaxation, music, guided imagery. While the uh, others like CBT, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy, yoga, meditation, distraction, guided imagery, and also counseling. Physical methods such as physiotherapy, chiropractic, and also osteopathy. While the physical method is ice, massage, acupuncture, dance, elevations, and hydrotherapy. Medication is non opioid, is paracetamol. And says like can be divided into COX-1 inhibitors or COX-2 inhibitors. For the medication, we have a weak opioids like the F018 and also Tramadol. We do have this in our hospitals. Strong opioids like morphine, patadine, oxycodone, fentanyl, and also when we use a strong opioids, we have the antagonist which is naloxone. So we should not be worried of the uh, effects. All right, because we do have some, uh, we do have a specific antagonist for that. All right, for the anti neuropathic agents, we have an antidepressant, SNRI, anticonvulsant, and others. 
So remember just now our pain pathway. So the treatment is based on the pain pathway. First, in the periphery, we can start with the non-drug treatment, our ICE, rest, immobilization, whole compression, and also elevations. While the drug treatment, we can use anti-inflammatory drugs such as NC and COX-2 and also local anesthetic agents. Treatment in the spinal cord, you can use an acupuncture and massage for the non-drug while medications for the local anesthetic opioids and also ketamine. Brain, you have a non-drug like psychological counseling and drug treatment, we have a paracetamol, opioids, amitriptyline and also Clonidine. So, analgesic strategies is basically what we are doing is actually we want to inhibit and ascending pain signals and we want to enhance the descending inhibitions. So, this is one of the uh, most important uh, slides. You can see that this is an analgesic ladder for the acute pain management. We have it in all wards and also in a specific uh, place like OT, ICU, CCU. So you can see that this analgesic ladder for the acute pain management is divided into four. First is MAU, the pain score of 1 to 3. You can start with the paracetamol plus minus and 6 COX-2 with a regular dose or PRN basis. For the moderate pain score, you can add on the weak opioids like tramadol and the F018. While the patient who came with the severe pain, more than 7, you can start with the uh, IV morphines. And those who actually, after you start with the IV morphine, given a uh, few, uh, few time for the, uh, for the durations of about 30 to 1 hour, and the patient is having persistent pain, then you should refer the patient to our acute pain services. So we can offer PCA, epidural, and also other pain interventions. We may consider to add on anti-neuropathic pain, uh, anti-neuropathic agents such as TCA, gabapentin, pregabalin for the neuropathic pain. So morphine and other opioids. So it's a myth about addictions, or it's a, it's a big question mark about addictions. So basically, addition does not occur if the morphine is used for the relief of the pain, uh, whether we use for the acute pain or, or cancer pain. Patient who is on PCA, PCA equals to patient control analgesia, will reduce the dose of the morphine once the wound is healed and pain decreases. Patient may develop tolerance, but it's usually not a problem when used in the short term for the management of the acute pain. So remember our spectrum of the pain. Acute pain, if we treat it properly, there is a healing process uh, ongoing. The end result will be no pain. Acute pain should be resolved in a few days once the acute cause has settled and began to heal. Usually, regular dose of the medication can be gradually be reduced and given as a PRN only once pain is settled. So, this is a chart of the reverse pain ladder for the acute pain. Whenever the patient came to you with the pain score of 10, you started with the paracetamol and said with the N IV morphine. You may consider PCA ketamine of Nevlog, which is under acute pain services team. Then the patient may reduce the pain score and if you treat it properly, inshallah, patient will discharge with no pain. Um... Remember, on it, uh, you can actually adjunct uh, in all level to add on the laxative such as anti laxative and also antiemetics with the opioids, and you may consider to add on neuropathic agents uh, as a component to pain relief. So prescription should be for the shortest duration, less than seven days. Of course, ideally we want to have a less than three days. And clinicians must review and assess again before providing a second prescription. So about the morphine pain protocol, how we want to dilute. So one ampule of morphine contains uh, 10 mg. 10 mg in one meal. So you can use 10 cc syringe and then make it into one mg per meal. So the dilution each time you want to give to the patient is 1 cc per time. 
So what you have to do after you give bolus of a 1 mg morphine or equals to 1 mL, every 5 minutes you should check for, for the pain score, sedation score and also respiratory rate. So this is a simplified of the uh, pain uh, diagram how we manage. So basically pain score more than 10. If the patient has no problem or the patient has a pain score less than 6, sorry, pain score less than 6, you do a routine observation. But when the patient has a pain score more than 6, you can use a morphine pain protocol of and if if um, you have used that, you can continue prepare and then give and then assess uh, every five minutes. Let's say you haven't done the pain uh, uh, pain protocol of your, so you can consult the doctors or superior. So those patients who actually under the age of sixty, you can use a one milligram per meal per bolus. For those patients who are actually more than 60 years old, we can use a IV morphine 0.5 mg or 0.5 mL per bolus. So every time you give morphine, you wait for 5 minutes and then you take the pain score. So no doubt there is a, some uh, workload increase in our workload by doing this, but I can assure you this is a worth it. Uh, because you want to see the happiness or the happy uh, face of our patients after we treat the pain properly. So remember, uh, again, uh, this is another diagram to emphasize about the pain. So what happens when you have a pain? So usually whether the doctors itself uh, identify the pain or we, uh, we get the information from our staff nurse. So what we can do, we create and we assess the pain score. And then we do have to classify whether this is acute pain or chronic pain. For the chronic pain, we should actually check whether the patient is under chronic pain uh, uh, clinic or under chronic pain follow up. While the acute pain, you can check whether there is a under APS or not. Usually, APS form is a yellow color, very bright yellow. You should can you should able to identify that from the PHD. So if the patient is under APS, you can straight away call the APS team. But if the patient is not under APS, so what you can do is you check the notes, you check whether there is a pain relief or analgesia being ordered. If no analgesia order, of course you have to order. So based on the um, our our analgesic ladder, remember just now four category: mild, moderate, severe, and uncontrolled. And if the patient has a uh, uh, analgesic uh, uh, been ordered, then you have to review whether uh, it's already been served or not, and ask about that and confirm with the nurse. And of course, you need to reassess after 30 minutes to one hour. If the pain score more than six, go and refer to APS. If the pain score of uh, less than six, then you can do the uh, monitoring as per usual. Okay, what are the management of the opioid side effect? First of all, people, uh, uh, nausea and vomiting is quite side common side effect of the opiates. How to treat is basically we do have a multiple uh, anti emetic or we call it as a multimodal anti emetic agent that we have in our hospitals. So one is a metacropomide, is a prokinetic agent. Others is an anti emetic like odensetron, granisetron, haloperidol and also dexamethasone. Well, the respiratory depression is very uncommon, but then when it occurs, it can be, uh, you must know how to treat. So what to do if there is a, you suspect that the patient may have a respiratory depression following the pain relief, uh, uh, following the opioids, you must confirm the diagnosis first. One, you must check the respiratory rate and count by yourself. The respiratory rate of is less than eight per minute. 8 breath per minute, you must check the sedation score is equals to 2 or sedation score equals to 3 and check for the pinpoints pupils. So 
if you confirm the diagnosis, first of all, you must stop the drugs and call for help. Second, give oxygen, whether using a face mask or nasopron. Then you can wake the patients up. The fourth one, you can start using a pure antagonist uh, nalazone. You can dilute 0.4 mg into 4 cc that equals to 1, 0.1 mg per mil. You can give titrating dose with a, a gap about 1 to 2 minutes until the patient wakes up or when the respiratory rate is more than 10 breaths per minute. Along the way, you must check the respiratory rate sedation score hourly for 4 hours. Give another dose of the nalazone if you see the respiratory depression recurs. And definitely, if it happens, you must refer to ICU or HDU for the close monitoring. What are the key points in the management of the acute pains? So basically, for the pain as the free vital sign to have an impact in the improving pain management in our hospital, we must have a good understanding about analgesic medication, how to use and when to use. So, important points to note on the pharmacological of the drugs, you must know about the onsets and durations of the ashes and the side effects. During and after administration of the uh, analgesic medication, we must monitor pain score, sedation score and respiratory rate. Achieve reasonable uh, dose without any uh, doubt. So basically, our analgesia can be uh, the best way to give uh, to relieve the pain is using a multimodal analgesia. One of the questions that my audience asked uh, from the previous um, talk is uh, the, the the definition of the multimodal analgesia. So basically, uh, multimodal analgesia means that we use um, multiple type of the pain relief that have a different uh, type of action so meaning that we kick we try to reduce the pain based on the uh, with the multiples uh, attacks lah. so last topic is uh, a bit about the pain in the pediatric patients so facts that we know today newness and even uh, premature babies can and do feel pain Pain experienced by children is no less and may even be more than the experience by the adults. Children react to and, to and report pain in different ways. They can become quiet or withdrawn instead of crying. Pain in children is still under-recognized and under-treated. Lots of unwarranted fears on the use of the pain medication, especially opioids. So how to assess pain in the children? So basically, you can use a mnemonics of Q-U-E-S-T-T. Q stands for question the child. U is use pain rating skills. E is evaluate behavioral and physiological changes. S secure the parents' involvement. T take the cause of pain into account. T take actions and evaluate results. First, questions of the child. You can use like adults, P-A-I-N. You ask and listen and believe what the child is saying to you. Place and the side of the pain, aggravating factors, intensity, nature and neutralizing factors. Use the pain rating score, uh, skills. Uh, remember that the tool chosen to assess must be individualized. Children more than 4 years old can reliably self-report the pain. For the younger children or infant, you must use the assessed behavioral and physiological changes using IASP or also or FLEX score. Children more than 7 years old, you can just use uh, visual analog, analog, analog skill uh, like an adult. And this tool should never be used singly but in conjunction with the parents and physician assessment. Evaluate behavioral and physiological changes. This can be used by the proxy as proxy measures for pain in younger children, infants and units who are not able to self-report. They should never be used singly. Behavioral like facial expression, crying, body posture and also activity. While the physiological, like heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, or pulmonary sweat. 
secure the parents' involvement. Get the parents' involvement in management of the, their child's plan. Parents are open good judge of their child's pain. However, if there is a discrepancy between the child and parents' report, do not overrule a child's response. Number five, take the cause of pain into account. Search for any possible simple reversible causes of pain. Or, anxiety may also be a cause of the pain. Sometimes, a child might, might cry due to separation anxiety and not in pain. Number six, take action in and evaluate the results. Do not, do not ignore any complaints. If pain is present, check with the patients and caregiver if intervention is required. Intervention is not necessarily a medication. It can just be touching, gentle massage, or hot or, hot or cold packs. Always evaluate response after any intervention. So basically, for the key concept in the pain management, the first one, by the ladder. Enabling a stepwise approach to the treatment. We remember our WHO energetic ladder, mild, moderate, severe, and also uncontrolled pain. Number two, by the clock, regular scheduling ensure to ensure a steady blood concentration, reduce the peak and through the PRN dosing. Number three, by the appropriate rules, route. Use the least invasive route of administration. Oral route is always convenient, non-invasive, and cost-effective. Number four, by the child. Individualize treatment according to the patient's, the child's pain and respond to the treatment. So, for the methods of the pain relief, the same goes for the pediatrics age group. We can divide into pharmacology and also non-pharmacology. As stated here, you can see the non-pharmacology is a bit uh, more uh, wide and more choices. For the pediatric age, age group, you can have a suitable environment as a part of the treatment, distractions, guided imagery, information before painful procedure, music, heat and cold packs and also massage and also physical therapy. Pharmacological therapy, you can have non opioids such as paracetamol and seeds like ibuprofen, naproxen, dethrophenic, meloxicum. While the opioid analgesic, we have weak opioids like tramadol, while the strong opioid like patidine and morphine. WHO analgesic ladder is the, almost the same like adult step 1, step 2 and step 3. Step 1, you can start with the non-opioids and adjuvants. Step 2, you can start with the tramadol as a weak opioid. Step 3, when the pain is very severe, you can start with the strong opioid like morphine, IV and non-opioid and other adjuvants. So, for the, for the paracetamol, the most commonly used analgesic in the children is a very excellent safety profile and lack of significant effect, side effects used for the mild to moderate pain. For more severe pain, can be combined with the opioids analgesics. The total daily dose not to exceed 90 mg per kilo per day in children, 60 mg per kilo per day in infants. Avoid more frequently than 4 hourly dosing. Oral is always better than rectal. Absorptions of the rectal paracetamol is very slow, somewhat is a variable, and is comparatively inefficient. NSAIDs like ibuprofen is indicated for the mild to moderate pain. Children appear to have lower incidence of the renal and GI side effect when compared to adults, even with the chronic and Opioids is a very useful for the treatment of pain in patients of all ages. Provide excellent analgesic with a side margin of safety for the vast majority of children. Roots of administration can be oral, IV, rectal, transdermal, or transmucosal. And oral and IV is always a route preferable. Avoid intramuscular injections unless absolutely necessary as, as children will deny they are in pain to avoid a shock. As a conclusion, infants and young children can and do feel pain. Untreated pain can have a negative impact and long-term consequences. Pain in a pediatric species need to be recognized and managed. Tools for the assessment is dependent not only on age of the child but also other factors. 
we treat we need to treat children in more human manner and be responsible to eliminate or assuage pain. Thank you for your kind attentions.